Hey there, today we'll take a look at an industry that affects our day-to-day -day lives. Standing here today, I'm in front of the stack machine and I have to make a choice. I have to make a decision, do I want something savory or do I want something sweet? Do I want something salty or do I want something bitter? This is a decision we all face daily and it's a decision that this company, this industry looks at. How, do, how can we address the needs of the people at the lowest cost and the best taste? So companies daily are coming up with different tastes, different flavors, and they're trying to produce something at the best cost and the best price for the consumers. Before we dive into logistics, let's take a look at where this industry got its start. This industry can be traced back to 1853 when George Crumb accidentally stumbled upon what would become one of the most popular snacks on the market. Rumor has it that one day a customer of Chum's was complaining that his french fries were cut too thick. Chum decided to take the extreme route and to cut the potatoes extremely thin so that the customer could not eat it with a fork. Ironically, the customers love this new food style, and from that point on, the production of potato chips would develop. New food concepts would be introduced and the industry would grow to this day. Behind the taste of these products, we recognize that there is a price range and convenience that makes this market of snacks so successful. Still riding the economic high from World War I, machinery technology and manufacturing effects made it possible for companies like Lay's, Little Debbie and Nabisco to make use of high skill manufacturing and distribution. Since that time period, corporation mergers and rising stock prices have allowed for these bigger participants like Pepsi Cola and Frito Lay to dominate the marketplace and store shelves. Let's take a look at some of the dominant characteristics of the snack food industry today. Having just experienced an economic recession, we can see the effect on the snack food market has been very minimal. Just in the past three years, the industry has seen a 6.6% .6 increase to a $20.3 billion revenue. As a matter of fact, we see some of the highest market increases in 2008 and 2009 during the peak of the recession. Revenues are recorded at a staggering $16.4 billion. That's a big number, so maybe we should break it down into the five major categories of the savory snack products and their gross value in the industry. Processed snacks take the lead at 38% of all savory snacks, followed by potato chips at around 24%, then nuts and seeds with 19.1%, and finally popcorn and other savory snacks with the remaining 18.9%. Now we'll take a look at the geographic makeup of the U.S. savory snacks market around the globe. We see the U.S. itself occupying 26% of sales, then Europe with 27%, then the Asian Pacific with around 29%, and the rest of the world only dominating 18% of the snack food sales. When we examine some of the major players in the snack food industry, it may come as a shock that Pepsi Cola holds approximately 29% of the market share, while the next largest segments are held by Kraft Foods and ConAgra, with both at about 4.5% of the market. And the final characteristics we see in the snack food industry is the major channels of distribution, supermarkets and hypermarkets at 76.3%, with convenience stores at 10.8%, and service stations at 5.3%. We mentioned a minute ago what we refer to as major players in the snack food industry. As macroeconomics students, you know exactly what we're talking about, but you might be wondering who has those titles. If you've paid attention, it's pretty clear that PepsiCo or Frito-Lay has a much higher percentage of market share. But that doesn't mean that they don't face competition. Companies like Jell-O, Nabisco, ConAgra, and Kraft all have a substantial influence on the market dynamics of snack foods. So then what gave Frito-Lay an advantage when the economy took a negative turn? Well, according to the Market Indicator Report, Frito-Lay owns six brands among the top ten named in the industry. In layman's terms, this means that other brands serve as substitute goods for what Frito-Lay produces. So when the consumer, who can still afford their groceries, takes a trip to the store, they're more than likely to pick a Frito-Lay company product than any other. Now, this behemoth's available resources are what makes it possible and their tried production methods to assure that they can produce what the customer wants at the lowest possible cost. But maybe this market has something more to question than the taste of food. 
What else could customers want from their snack food producers outside of a cheap, salty fix? Well, more recently, we've begun to see consumers express a desire for healthier food options. Marketingcharts.com says, Brands are losing their relevance, except in Argentina and China. Only one-third of consumers cited brand name among factors they consider when buying food. Name lags well behind factors such as quality, price, health benefits, value, convenience of preparation, and taste. Typically these products are even a little pricier than the popular brand names we might normally choose. But we're even seeing this transition to healthier food take place in political motions like First Lady Michelle Obama's Healthy School Lunch Campaign. See, a lesser known brand like Kashi, for example, has seen a lot more publicity in the last few years than ever before. This rising competing force is causing companies like Nabisco and Little Debbie to reevaluate their traditional methods of production. And this is the reason that an intelligent strategy for any company, especially one as large as PepsiCo, would be to utilize research and development to improve the health benefits of their most popular products. Another strategy that might be considered, particularly by smaller competitors, would be mergers and joint production. With PepsiCo dominating the grocery store shelves, it could be of benefit to combine product lines in order to maximize profit potential. SeekingAlpha.com weighed in on this concept in their web article saying, The first things that are evident in these opportunistic buys and mergers are, companies are looking for scale in order to drive lower cost and increase their leverage and positions in snack food aisles. A few obvious benefits to making a business decision like this are increased stock prices and a higher presence on store shelves for any one corporation. It may seem like a lot, but when Brito-Lay owns 60% of consumers' favorite brands, consolidation becomes a key component to success. Clearly, consumers are demonstrating a desire for more nutritional benefits for their favorite products. This may even come in the form of just highlighting what nutrition is already there. A snack food manufacturer needs to utilize all of their resources to produce the healthiest product at the lowest possible cost. In addition, it may be a benefit for a mass producer to narrow their own product line to focus the attention of their customers. Too many items that sell poorly are being kept on store shelves purely because they represent the company's brand. In the end, it'd be better to perfect a few products in lieu of producing a massive line of mediocrity. For us, what's been very important at Kind is to try to find the balance between maintaining wholesomeness but also making a product convenient. I think there's there's a lot of challenges in doing that. It's much easier to make something uh, artificial or long-lasting uh, where it loses the essence of the product and for us what we're trying to do both with our Fruit Not Bars, with the kind Fruit Not Bars but also with new products that we're launching in the coming months is to challenge that notion and to try to come up with something that people can recognize but that takes their taste buds to the next level. We have three of the top brands in health and wellness. We're going to leverage these brands and the health and wellness category momentum to grow this nutrition business. And I know some of you have expressed some concern whether the pendulum swung too far in this direction and whether we took our eye off the core offerings. What I'd like to tell you is that the direct answer is this is an and game, not an or game. We have to focus on both growing the core which is the fun for you products and the better for you products, and step up our investment in good for you products. And I show you that that's what we've done and will continue doing. With all of this competition, it is necessary on every level to have a customer loyalty basis. The suppliers need the manufacturers to demonstrate repetitive buying habits, and the manufacturers seek the loyalty of consumers to their brand name. The economic downturn a few years ago led to the decrease in customers' loyalty to their favorite brands. When they cannot afford the higher priced name brand, they will tend to turn to generic brands, even if it is only a small saving. But with an improving economy comes new business ventures. So what do prospective companies face when trying to enter this industry? Unfortunately, the entry process in the snack food market does not generally see success. In fact, it is more likely that if a new product were developed independently, that the concept would be bought out by one of the residing companies. This is due in part to the extreme difficulty that comes with development and a production size that would see any profit margin. This is not to say that a new company could not test the market on a local scale like Uncle Ray's Potato Chips, for example. A smaller company can see successful business on a local scale and could soon branch out to compete in the global snack food industry. As far as exiting the market is concerned, even a company like Hostess that goes out of business may cause a media storm, but would not drastically affect the climate of the industry. The two most prominent components of even small-scale success include the security of raw material contracts. Your suppliers determine your cost of production. Beyond that, reserving the shelf space is essential. 
Both components require a level of loyalty to the seller. Finally, a successful snack food manufacturer will pay specific attention to consumer trends, like the health movement for example. If a company can see what customers will be demanding in the near future, then they have the ability to secure that niche before it becomes the focus of other competitors. And global growth will always be a necessity in this industry. With Europe and Asia Pacific composing around 60% of global demand, it is clear that a worldwide orientation be taken for the grand scale of the snack food industry to be contended with. So, we have learned that the savory snack food industry is one of rapid change and growth. Entering this highly competitive environment can be a daunting task, but when an industry player can give its attention to customer trends, supplier relationships, and potential for corporate mergers, there will always be potential for success in this industry.